We are up to chapter 5, Mishnah number 23, and today we're going to do Mishnah number 23 and Mishnah number 24. Yehuda ben Tema Omer. Yehuda, the son of Tema, says, Havi az kanamer. You should be as bold as a leopard. Vikal kanesher. And as light as an eagle. Ratz tetzvi, swift as a deer. Vidibar ka'ari, and strong and mighty as a lion. La'asos, for son of Yehoshua, to do the will of your father in heaven. So the first mitz. So the first Mishnah here tells us that we should adopt the characteristics of these four animals, be as bold as a leopard, as light as an eagle, as swift as a deer, and as mighty as a lion in fulfilling the will of our Creator, our Father in Heaven. So that's Mishnah number 23. Mishnah number 24, Hu Haya Omer, he would say to the same author, Az Panim Le Gehenom. Someone who is brazen-faced goes to Gehenom. Now, you'll notice that the word Uz is appearing in both Mishnahs. We're told to be Uz, to be as, as, as bold or as brazen as a leopard. And then we're told to not be brazen-faced because then you'll end up in Gehenom, in purgatory. Uboshe is him, but someone who is shame-faced, who's more bashful, Liganadin will end up in Ganadin in paradise. Hashem may be the will before you. That the temple be rebuilt speedily in our days. The same Chalkenu Besorasacha. And you should give us our portion in your Torah. So we have uh, this uh, these so we have these two Mishnahs. So we have these two Mishnahs taught by the same teacher, Yehuda Ben Tema. In the first, he tells us to adopt the four characteristics of these animals to be bold like a leopard and light like an eagle and swift like a deer and mighty like a lion. And then we're told brazen-faced is not good, bashful-faced is good. So it's uh, many of the commentaries tell us here that these two missions are connected to the same author because there's a common theme here. Ordinarily, to be brazen, to be bold, is not really a Jewish characteristic. We encourage, or the Torah encourages, more bashfulness. To be more, to be less braggadocious, not to be so loud, to be more gentle, to be more calm, to be more composed, to be on the quieter side, to be on the modest side. Nevertheless, there are times when we ought to adopt the boldness of a leopard to fulfill the will of the Almighty. So in general, Boldness and being brazen and being outgoing and aggressive, those are not Jewish qualities unless it's used sparingly and in a targeted fashion. In fact, the commentaries point out that the Talmud tells us that there are three characteristics of the descendants of Abraham of the Jewish people. In fact, the Talmud says that someone who does not have these three characteristics, you have to doubt their heritage, you have to question their pedigree, because it's likely that they actually are not part of the Jewish people, and they're just pretenders. What are these three characteristics? Baishanim, which means bashful. Rachmanim, merciful. Gomle chasadim, kind-hearted. People want to do kindness with others. These are the three characteristics of the Jewish people. Jews are merciful are kind-hearted, and are bashful. So much so, the Talmud says, these are the three characteristics of the Jewish people. You don't have it. It calls into question. It casts doubts on your pedigree. Now the, commentators, now, the commentators here tell us that bashfulness in general is a very good quality, and it is a protection against sin. The quote our sages who tell us, Call Adam, every person, sheyesh lo boshes panim, that has shame, that gets ashamed, lo b'meheira hu chote, doesn't sin very easily. Meaning that when someone is bashful, it means they're very sensitive to their behavior. And they're worried about what they're going to do and how they're going to be perceived. They value, so to speak, their, their, their identity. They care about themselves. That's what, it, that's what shame is. Someone who's shameless doesn't really care about themselves. If you care about yourselves, then you'll make sure that you behave properly 
and you won't suffer the ill effects of messing your life up, of making mistakes, of doing terrible things, of ending up in bad places. Now, the Rabbeinu Yoni here, he goes through some really scary teachings in the Mishnah about someone that does not have the quality of shame, someone who's shameless. So he quotes the Mishnah, and the Mishnah brings kind of a very scary dispute amongst the authors of the Mishnah. The first opinion says, Az Panim, someone who's brazen-faced, shameless, Rabbi Eliezer says, you know for sure that he's a mamzer. You know that he is a bastard. He is illegitimate. Someone that has no shame, you could tell that his parents had no shame, and they were not embarrassed to behave in a very immoral, improper, promiscuous fashion, and therefore it's, it's likely that he was conceived out of wedlock in an illegitimate fashion. That's the first opinion. The second opinion is the opinion of Rabbi Yeshua. Rabbi Yeshua says he is a ben nida, meaning his mother was menstruating at the time of his conception, and consequently the father and mother were not allowed to be together according to Torah law. According to Torah law, when a woman is menstruating, she is prohibited to her husband. And therefore, we could tell that someone who was so shameless, someone like that, we can assume that the conception was done also in a shameless fashion. His parents completely disregarded the laws of the Torah, and they were shameless in doing so. And as a result, they produced a child that is shameless as well. Finally, comes along Rabbi Akiva, and he says something novel. He says, if you see someone who's completely shameless, you know that he is a mamzer, number one, and he was conceived in the sin of Anida. And in fact, the Mishra gives a, a story where they saw a very shameless person. And Rabbi Akiva says, I am sure about this person, that he is a mamzer and he is a ben nida. He's both a mamzer and a ben nida. And, and the other colleagues questioned it. He says, I'm going to prove you I'm right. So he went to the mom and says, tell me the story. Tell me the story of the conception of your son. What actually happened? Tell me the real story. And if you tell me the real story, I guarantee you that I'll pull you out of the deepest realms of purgatory and I'll bring you to Omaba. Sounds like a good deal. So she says, okay, I'll tell you what happened. At my wedding night, it turns out that I became Anita. I started menstruating. And as a result, prohibited to her husband. So she got married. And then she was not allowed to be with her husband. And one of the groomsmen assaulted her. And she conceived from him. And indeed, the child is not legitimate, is both a mamzer and a benida. Indeed, Rabbi Kiva's position was justified. So again, this is trying to show you the severity that the Torah associates with brazenness. The Mishnah there actually continues and says that someone who is brazen, you know for sure that his antecedents did not stand at the foot of the mountain. And this is implying that the impression the Jewish people got at the foot of the mountain when they were by, by, by Mount Sinai, when they were by Mount Sinai, and the whole nation experienced prophecy as one. That actually changed the souls of all those people that were there and forever impressed upon them a certain modicum, a certain measure of fear of God and sensitivity to one's behavior. And if you see someone who's completely shameless and brazen faced, you can assume that his antecedents did not stand at the foot of the mountain because someone who did would be influenced forever and their descendants after them to be more sensitive to their behavior. Now, Rabbi Yona adds a memorable teaching to this. And in fact, many years ago, we spoke about this, this teaching that he brings and the reason, why I, the reason why I remember it is because it's quite memorable. It tells a story of, of two 
two friends that were walking in the desert. And they chance upon a stinking, rotting carcass of a dead animal. And it looks awful, and it smells bad, and it's putrid. And one of them says, oh, it's so disgusting. Oh, how putrid is this carcass? And the other one says, yes, but look how white its teeth are. Look how white its teeth are. At least it has nice, white, pearly white teeth. So Rinio says that the, the attitude of, of, of the bashful one is not to always look at someone else and try to find their flaws. It's to try to find the positive things about another person. Not to be like the shark who is brazen and always attacking and always trying to find the vulnerabilities in everyone and everything that they encounter. And he brings this idea, call ha posel, bemumo posel. Whoever finds flaws and shortcomings in someone else, you know for sure that they themselves harbor that same flaw. This is the idea of projection. It's called today projection. When you have a really terrible quality flaw, a shortcoming, and you always find it in someone else, you're actually projecting your own flaw upon others. And this is found in the Talmud. Kralaposel, the Mumaposel. This is the characteristic of a brazen person, and this is what we are encouraged to avoid, and this is, in fact, the hallmark of the Jewish people. We are bashful. Nevertheless, nevertheless, we're told, even though in general we're supposed to be bashful people, when it comes to doing the will of God, Sometimes that requires us to adopt a brazen posture. Even though normally a bashful, uh, a bashful face is encouraged and a brazen face is discouraged. And someone who is brazen face, we're told, is going to end up in Gehenna. That's in the normal circumstances. But sometimes you're going to need to marshal unusual characteristics to be able to fulfill the will of the Almighty. And in that instance, sometimes it's appropriate for you to adopt the brazenness and the boldness and the ferocity of a leopard, even though under normal circumstances, even though, even though under normal circumstances, even though under normal, ah, even though under normal circumstances, why can I say that? That's why my brain is like still messed up from last week. So that's again, even though under normal circumstances, that would be problematic. When it comes to the will of the mighty, we sometimes have to find very unusual reservoirs of energy to be able to do and to execute his will. And this is an idea that we see that there's like a kosher outlet for a very bad character trait. Normally to be brazen is like one of the worst things. Yet... When it comes to doing the will of the Almighty, sometimes it's appropriate to find that very bad characteristic and use it for the right thing. And this is, by the way, a theme that we see elsewhere, that we're supposed to try to get everything in our universe to do to use for good. Everything, even things that are ordinarily on their own, they're bad, but there is a way to take everything and use it for good. And this is an example of that. Brazenness generally is a really bad thing. It could be used for good, and that is what we are encouraged to do. Now, what does it mean to be bold like leopard? What does it mean to be light like an eagle and swift like a deer and mighty like a lion? So, of course, all the commentaries, they all offer their own their own way of explaining what exactly we are encouraged to do here. What does it mean to emulate these animals? So first of all, we had a Mishnah earlier in the second chapter of Perkyavos. The Mishnah said, Lo habayshan lamed. Someone who's bashful, someone who's always embarrassed, meek, quiet, scared to get involved. Someone like that will never learn. The only way to, to learn, to study, to grow, to change is to be a little bit aggressive. You don't understand something, and uh, you don't want to ask a question because, you know, what will people think? And you don't want to actually bother someone because how can I bother them and ask them a question? And that attitude is not a good attitude. 
when it comes to study, you have a requirement to actually come to face with the, with the fact that you need to learn. It's imperative for your life that you grow and study and learn. And you have to do whatever it takes. And if you're too bashful, you won't learn. And that is a problem. So in that instance, when you're studying something and you don't understand something, you need to be aggressive. You need to be bold. You need to be outgoing. You need to be fierce until you understand it. That's one idea. Another idea we're told over here is that we were put here to accomplish big things. The Almighty did not make us with the intention that we forever remain mediocre and ordinary. That's not the objective. We have greatness within us, and we are required to try to discover that and to develop that and to cultivate that and to actualize all the potential that we have within us. And the only way that someone can actually do that is if they overcome their imposter syndrome. Since you were a little kid, they're telling you, sit down, follow instructions, do your homework, sit in your seat. And then, God forbid, if you end up in the, in the corporate world, all you're told is about how small you are and how limited you are and how there's hierarchy and speak to your boss. The Torah tells us that every human can have a relationship with the almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, the only creator, the only power that actually exists. And every small human can have a connection with God. An amazing thing. The smallest of humans, the most insignificant of people, are all mandated and required to develop a relationship with the Almighty. Moreover, every person is unique. Every person has a mission. Everyone has responsibilities entrusted to them by the Almighty. This is a very different attitude. Everyone's presented over here as being capable of immense things. But to do that, you have to have a little dose of boldness, a little dose of ferocity, of brazenness, to say that I am here to do something big. The Mishnah tells us every person has to say the following statement. Chayav Adam Lomar. A person has to say, Bishvili nivra ha'olam. The world was created for me. We're told to be humble, bashful, yes. And you have to say the entire world was created for me. I have the whole world on my shoulder. Every deed that I do determines the future destiny of all of mankind. These are sentiments that sound a little megalomaniacal. It sounds crazy for a person to say that. There's billions of people in the world. And who are you? You're insignificant. You're a small person. You don't matter. That's what the world tells us. What does the Torah tell us? Every person has to believe that the entire world was created for them and they alone can determine the fate of all of creation. To have that attitude, to undertake the initiative of saying, I am going to do whatever I can to change the whole world, that attitude demands the ferocity and the boldness and the brazenness and the chutzpah of a leopard. A leopard, by the way, is not as strong as a lion. But it has an outsized confidence, we're told, in believing that it is unparalleled. It's the king of the jungle. That's what the leopard actually believes. It's not true. But you have to have a little bit of that irrational confidence used properly, targeted properly, you have to be as bold and as fierce as a leopard to undertake such an initiative, to go for the gold. I remember I once had a, I had a need to speak to someone very important. 
and I was a little scared. Well, he's so busy, and there's so many other things on his plate. And how am I going to get through to him? And what's going to be? And who can I speak to that can maybe speak to him? And for like a few months, I was like tormented by this problem. And one day I said, wait a minute. Every single day in my prayer, I speak to the Almighty. If I could go to the Almighty and say, help me with my small petty problems, I could go to this person and say, help me with my problem. So I just picked up the phone and got his home number and called him and spoke to him and went to visit him. And the next day I had my problem solved. I think that was a little bit of, of, of boldness. It's chutzpah. Who are you? You're nobody. But sometimes you have to just do it because that's what you need to do. Go for it. Give him a call. If you pray to God, you can speak to another person. You know, with respect to children, I always have the following dilemma. You know, I think with a parent or any educator, really, but certainly a parent. So a good parent understands or tries to study the characteristics and the qualities and, of course, the flaws of their charges. You know, you have a child. Every child's unique. Every child's different. And as a parent, you're trying to nudge them and direct them so they could flourish, right? That's what that's almost like the number one job of a parent, right? So I always had a dilemma. What to do when you have a very capable child and maybe there are two paths that you could try to nudge them upon. One path is the safe path. This is safe. This is what everyone does. This is proven. This is an established path. And you know this is safe. And then there's the second path that's aggressive, that's going for the gold that's really shooting for the stars, which one do you do? So as kind of a, a mature, as a parent, I think my, my thinking on this evolves. I used to always think that you got, you got to be safe. You got to be safe. You got to cover your downside, as they say. Don't expose yourself to too many risks. It's better to just be safe and not to be too aggressive and, you know, not to take too many risks. Over time, I think my, my thinking has changed. No, you go for it all. Burn the boats, burn the bridges. Go for it all. Be bold, be aggressive, go for it. Now, I think my thinking has even evolved further to say that ultimately, you know, the choices have to be made by the child themselves. And you could be like the guardrails, you know, the scaffolding to help to help them. You try to, you know, implant certain seeds and to you know to, to build some of the the you know the infrastructure of their life, but ultimately they have to make these choices. But I think I think that that's what the Almighty really wants of us. He tells us before Sinai, if you accept the Torah. If you tell the Torah, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. He doesn't say, you know, a, a, a village of average people and an okay nation. The Jewish people were told that we're going to be the Navy SEALs, the best of the best, creme de la creme, the best. That's what he wants of us. Why shouldn't we do the same for our children? Why not go for it all? So these are part of the ideas of what our sages tell us here when we're told, when we're advised to be as bold as a leopard. A few more of the ideas here. Rabbi Yona says that part of boldness and ferocity that's being encouraged here is to reprimand the sinners. Most people think, you know what? Mind your own business. Just focus on your life and worry about your affairs. The Torah tells us not. So, the Torah tells us, You should surely 
reprimand and castigate your brother. If you see your brother or your sister, of course, somebody you care about and they're making mistakes, you are required to nudge them back to the right path. That's your responsibility. But of course, you feel like an imposter. Most of us don't feel like, you know, I wasn't nominated to do this. No one gave me a mandate to castigate others. We have in our society kind of a live and let live policy. I'll do my things, get the government, get the neighbors out of my life, let let everyone do their own thing as long as they're not harming other people. That's the attitude that we have in this country. And that, of course, is, is good for certain things. But we are told that you have to sometimes reprimand others. And to reprimand others, you have to marshal, again, a very unnatural force, and that is a certain degree of boldness and brazenness and ferocity. The Balaturim, one of the commentators, he says another thing. You want to do a mitzvah. You want to do what's right. But what are you worried? Oh, what are my colleagues going to say? Oh, what are my friends going to say? Oh, all the people on Facebook, what are they going to say? You're worried. Someone's going to mock you. Someone's going to deride you. They're going to laugh at you behind your back. You're embarrassed about what, about what other people are going to say about you or think about you. The leopard doesn't worry about other people. Tell them to pound sand, as they say. Get lost. Drop dead. What do you worry about other people? That's what we're encouraged here to do. Of course, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to do this because we're very, we're very social animals. And we're very impressionable. And we're very much affected by what other people think about us. But we are encouraged to develop the ferocity and the boldness of a leopard when we know that we need to do something good and we're worried about what other people think. Don't worry about them. Be fierce. Be bold. Be like the lion. Be like the leopard. And do what's right. Now, there's an interesting nuance that the Ruach Haim points out. If you look at these two Mishnas, we're told to be, to be bold, but not to be bold-faced. To be brazen, but not to be brazen-faced. What this means is that a person, the, the sweet spot, is when a person has the ferocity, has the boldness, but it's not evident on their face. Meaning you, you internally, you muster up that, that energy and that inspiration and that boldness, but you don't let it display externally. You kind of develop an internal resolve to do what's right, but once it's on your face, then it's already very close to, to arrogance and aloofness and hubris, and that is when it gets dangerous. So that's the idea of being bold like a leopard. What about flying like an eagle? So the eagle, of course, flies higher than any other bird. And one of the sages points out, you know, our responsibility is to be big, is to be great, and to ascend over pettiness. Almost the most important thing that we need to be in our lives is big people, not little people, not small, petty people. And that's what the Torah is really doing to us. The Torah is kind of reformatting our world and our Weltanschauung to become bigger people. And to do that properly, sometimes we have to fly and soar above the smallness and the pettiness of our world. One of the other commentators says that we have to be indefatigable. An eagle can travel great distances and it doesn't get tired. We're told that we too have to be indefatigable and not get tired. Now what this means is, perhaps we can suggest, if you look at the first place that the Torah said someone was tired, that is Esav, 
in chapter 25, verse 29 of Genesis. Jacob is making a stew, and Esau comes from the field, and he is tired. What does Rashi say? What does the Talmud say? The Talmud said he's tired because of all the sins that he did that day. In fact, the Talmud says he did five horrific sins that day. He, he was raping and murdering and doing heresy and, of course, neglecting the firstborn right. And that is the Torah's definition of exhaustion, of exhaustion. Exhaustion, by the Torah's definition, is spiritual exhaustion. What truly made someone tired is when their soul is pained by their choices. And the soul just wants to kind of disable the body for a little bit. Stop doing all these terrible sins to me. Oh, you're sullying me. Let me make you tired. Mitzvos, Torah, doesn't tire a person. At least not on a spiritual level. And therefore we're told, just like the eagle is indefatigable, we should be energetic and upbeat, doing the will of the Almighty, and we will be energized like the eagle. And then we're told to be swift like a deer. And normally, we're encouraged to be more circumspect, and again, to be more risk averse and not to move fast and break things. Think before you act, think before you speak. And here we're told to be swift like a deer. What this means that in certain areas of our lives, we cannot be slow and lumbering and indecisive we have to be we have to be swift we have to be agile the mishnah earlier tells us we have to run to an easy mitzvah as if it were a difficult mitzvah mitzvahs are something we have to run to and the reason we have to run to it is because we're running in the face of heavy winds there's headwinds stopping us from doing from implementing the agenda of our soul. And in order to overcome those headwinds, we have to run. It's been compared, life's been compared to ascending, a descending escalator. Have you seen that? Kids go to the mall, and all they want to do is to run up the escalator that's pushing everyone down. And it's a race against the machine. Man versus the machine. That is what our life is a little bit like. Our soul has this agenda, very ambitious agenda, to do mitzvot, to do Torah, to fulfill the will of the Almighty, to become great. But we have the body and the society and the eight Sahara and the inborn habits and traits and shortcomings. And the only way to change the calculus is to run and to try to just instinctually pursue the mitzvot. Don't, uh, don't sit around and wait. We're told that mitzvos, the word mitzvos, the way how do you spell the word mitzvos, it uses the same letters as the word matzos, like a matzah. If you've ever had the privilege of watching matzah being baked, you see it's all about speed. Because if you allow the dough to, to rest for a little bit, it becomes hummus. And in fact, we're told, our sages tell us that mitzvos and matzos are spelled the same way because the way we have to do both of them is the same. It's got to be with speed. And if we tarry and we wait and we sit around, before we know it, there's chametz and the mitzvah and the matzah gets corrupted. So for certain things, we have to indeed be swift like a deer. And finally, mighty like a lion. And our sages tell us that that refers to a certain internal fortitude to be able to resist temptation and to overcome our Yetzirahara. Moreover, every job requires a certain degree of might 
to be able to bring it to completion. The beginning of any project is always exciting. It's a new initiative. It's something new. And that always, you know, awakens our interest. But when you've been slogging through a project and you have the last little bit of work, that's always the hardest. And to finish it, you need to marshal the might of a lion to conclude it. So these are some of the lessons that we take from animals. We're told even though, generally speaking, those who are bashful end up in a good place, those who are brazen end up in a very bad place, under certain circumstances, used properly, directed properly, we ought to adopt the brazenness of a leopard, the speed and agility of a deer, the lightness and the flight of an eagle, and finally the might of a lion. Now it's interesting that this is not the only thing we're told that we can study and we can learn from animals. One of the, com one of the commentaries actually says that every single animal has some unique quality to it in which it is unmatched by any other animal. And we have to discover what is the unique quality of every animal and study from it. And we're told to learn from everything. Everything that we encounter can be a lesson of some sorts. And here we have a study of these four animals, and each one of them has a unique characteristic and we're told that everything can be adopted, again, under the proper circumstances for us in our mission in our lives. The Talmud of the Book of Erevan, page 100b, on the bottom, tells us that if we did not have Torah, we could have studied some of the laws and the lessons of the Torah from the animals. We would have learned modesty from a cat and an aversion not to steal from an ant, and fidelity in our marriage from a dove. The dove only mates with one mate. And proper behavior from a rooster. What this is again telling us is that, of course, we have the Torah. So we have a distilled lesson, guidebook of how to behave, manual for living, comes straight from God. But the world created by God. And therefore, the world and the Torah originate in the same source. Both of them are the handiwork and the, pro and the products of the Almighty. And therefore, it's possible to learn the lessons of the Torah from the world as well. Because after all, they have the same author. They were crafted by the same creator. And this Mishnah tells us, even though we have Torah, we have Torah, we have the direct instruction, nevertheless, there are lessons that we can still derive from the world around us. Every animal has a quality in which it supersedes, it is unmatched by any other. And we have to discover that, and we have to integrate that into our worship of the Almighty. We're told again, when it comes to worshiping the Almighty, we must select and choose the characteristics of the animals that we meet. And I would imagine by extension, any other lesson that we learn can be used for this noble and sacred mission of executing the will of the Almighty. My email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com.